Hello, and welcome to episode 33 of The Witcher chapter by chapter book review, where I'll go through a summary of what happened in the latest chapter, and I will provide you with my detailed thoughts on it. Today, I'm discussing chapter 5 from Baptism of Fire. You know what? Let's just jump into it. Let's just do it. <laughs> As I'm sure you know by now, I'll, I'll chat a little bit before I go directly into the recap of the last episode and just go through the episode as usual. Um, I'm not going to do that this time. I got nothing to talk about. It's a, just an ordinary day for me. So let's go into the recap of the last episode, the last chapter. Summarize this chapter and then talk about it. So after a successful fight against Nilfgaard in a refugee camp, Temerian soldiers capture Geralt and Dandelion and bring them to their camp where Marshal Visigurd of Sintra, who holds a grudge against the Witcher, sentences the two to death. Meanwhile, Ciri is now having prophetic dreams about Geralt. Well, that was your recap of the previous chapter. Here is the summary of chapter 5. After the Nilfgaardian attack on the camp erupted, Milva goes after the peasant thieves who tried stealing their horses. She's about to be successful when they start fighting back and almost get the upper hand, but they're stopped by Kahir, who turns out to be alive and still interested in helping Geralt find Ciri. While Kahir is telling Milva that Ciri isn't in Nilfgaard, Regis approaches and tells them about Geralt and Dandelion's whereabouts and sets off to rescue them. He manages to do so by placing the sentries guarding the building the two are being kept in into a very deep sleep. Geralt and Dandelion disguise themselves as soldiers and are right about to make their way safely out of the camp until they're stopped by other soldiers who steal Dandelion's money. They make a break for it but get caught right in front of an oncoming Nilfgaardian attack against the stationed Temerian army. Geralt manages to fight off some of the soldiers, grab one of their horses, and take off in the direction toward Milva. Unfortunately, Dandelion is grazed by an arrow, but luckily not bad enough to be killed, just slightly wounded. They arrive at the location Milva and Kahir are waiting, and Regis reappears to help take care of Dandelion's wound. This is when Geralt pulls his sword on Regis, threatening him to step away from his friend, and lets the group know their companion is actually a vampire. It all makes sense now. <laughs> Regis confirms this and agrees to leave at Geralt's demand. Now that Geralt is done with Regis, he angrily approaches Kahir, who is quickly defended by Milva since Kahir saved her life, and also because she's fed up with Geralt's mood swings. I'm, I kind of am too. <laughs> Kahir reveals to Geralt that he's been having the same prophetic dreams about Ciri, including one Geralt never talked about, where Ciri emotionlessly murders a drunk man who accosted her. Regis shows back up to change Dandelion's bandages and talks to Geralt, who seems like he may be accepting of Kahir and Regis's presence. The group works together to make soup, they eat, and decide to continue on in the direction of druids, who may be able to assist them in locating Ciri. Well, Kahir is alive, which is pretty good. Uh, We'll talk about him a little bit more in detail because we get to know him more in this chapter than we have previously. So what happened with him was he was actually ambushed by these brigands. So this is why we thought he was dead because they, his horse turned up. There was blood on the saddlecloth. Uh, but he explains what actually happened. He was ambushed by these brigands. He defeated them, but his horse just got away. And then he had to continue following Geralt and the group on foot. So it took him a while to catch up to them. And yeah, we get to see that he, I mean, he appears to be. This is the most we've gotten to know of him. We've it, It's so interesting because we've known him or known of him for so long now. And we have learned next to nothing about this guy. But he seems super considerate and kind. And he does these things like he saves Milva, even though he didn't necessarily need to. I mean, I know he was trying to uh, get to Geralt. And maybe he thought that if he helped Milva, the Milva and Kahir could work together to get to Geralt. But still, he, he really didn't need to do that. And he did so. And he even gives her her arrow back from chapter three. She shot it at that one guy who was taking off. 
and then Kahir, they heard Kahir kill the guy in the woods. And the guy actually was shot by one of Milva's arrows, but not bad enough that he wasn't able to get away. And she was really disappointed about that. But Kahir actually got the arrow and held on to it for her so he could give it back to her. And he does. So that was really nice. And he shares his canteen with her when she's thirsty. And he's really concerned about her when she's feeling unwell and she's cold. So I like him. Maybe there is something going on that we don't know about yet because he has seemed like an enemy for a long time. But I, from the little bit we get to know about him in this chapter, I, I like him. He's He doesn't seem like a bad person. So he tells Milva at first that Siri is not in Nilfgaard. So this is the first time that anybody in the group gets any sort of um, revelation about, not about Siri's whereabouts, but about the fact that Siri is not where they're heading, where they've been heading. So during this part of the chapter, we cut away to these other sections that give us a little bit more background on things that have been going on and things that are going on in other places of the world with other minor characters. So we get to see some important details and a lot of them kind of have the same theme and I'm gonna get to that, but it's, oh, it's super interesting. So <laughs> the first one is the elf that we've only heard about up till now, uh, Foil Tiarna. Again, I don't know if I'm saying that name right. I may be butchering. I'm saying it the same way I said it last time. So if I said it wrong last time and now again, I apologize, but that's, I think anybody will admit this is not a <laughs> simple name. This is a pretty complicated name as far as the um, names that are difficult to pronounce in these books goes. But anyway, so we meet him for the first time while he's interrogating a Nilfgaardian military intelligence officer. This Nilfgaardian was part of a group ordered to trap and capture Fuel So the plan was to capture and take him to Veridin so that they could torture and interrogate him so that he would provide them with Ryan's, Vilgefortz, and Kahir's whereabouts. Phil Tiarna knows nothing about where they ended up after Thanad. Well, I mean, he was with Kahir for a little bit after Thanad, so uh, he doesn't know anything about where Vilgefortz or Ryan's ended up, or if they're dead, or he doesn't know anything about them. But when it comes to Kahir, as we know from that chapter, he, uh, I think it was chapter three, he actually was sending Kahir to the, to Nilfgaard. They wanted him and he was willing to just hand him right over. He put him in a coffin and sent them to Nilfgaard. Obviously, Kahir didn't make it, but still he did what he needed to do. And anything that happened past that point, it wasn't necessarily his fault. So this is actually how Fotiarna learned that Kahir was not successfully delivered when he sent him through those hawkers. But Amir or Vatier de Rideau, I don't know if it's both of them or one or the other, but uh, they basically wanted to interrogate anybody that might have been involved in bringing this false Siri to Amir. Kahir had nothing to do with that, but he was going to be executed by Nilfard anyway. So he basically Kahir just failed at doing what he was supposed to do, what he was sent out to do. He was supposed to bring the real Siri and then somebody else brings a false one. So keep this information in mind while I go through the next couple of parts, because I'm going to talk about how like the common link with all of them, the common thread, if you will, whatever. <laughs> so another scene that we cut away to is between Asire and Fringilla Vigo. So Asire is, if you recall, the Nilfgaardian mage that we met at the lodge meeting. And Fringilla Vigo is her friend who we have not met before. So she is another Nilfgaardian sorceress. And the two of them discuss Kahir's involvement in this double with Siri. They don't really talk about him too much, but that's basically the reason that they met because they wanted to discuss the fact that he's been... Um, ordered to be arrested and executed. They know that that's not happening right now because the Nilfgaard doesn't have their hands on him, but that was like the main thing that they were talking about. But we learn a lot of other things. So what was going on in this conversation was they talk about that before Amir went to the astrologer Zarthesius, 
he actually sought out help locating Siri from mages, and he provided them with a lock of the real Siri's hair. So he did that with Zarthesius, as we saw in that one chapter. Um, still no clue as to how Amir has real Siri's hair. I, I think we are meant to believe that it, it is the Siri that we know and love. It really is a lock of her hair. And they also said in this chapter that it belonged to a six-year-old. So not only does he have Siri's hair, but he acquired a lock of her hair when she was only six years old. Super bizarre. No answers on that, though. But now they have access to the fake Siri's hair, and they have been able to determine that it's definitely the, the hair from the six-year-old girl, the hair from the girl that's supposed to be Siri that's currently in Nilfgaard, they're able to determine those are two different people for sure. It's not the hair belonging to the same person, even though it's years apart, they've got their mean being mages and they know that it's definitely like confirmed, not the same person. So keep that in mind too, when I go to the next part, but um, this part of the chapter actually ends um, this meeting with the Syrah and Fringilla ends with the Syrah inviting Fringilla to the lodge. If you remember, Philippa actually granted um, Asire an extra seat for another Nilf Guardian so that Asire wouldn't be the only Nilf Guardian mage. So I think that we can expect to see Fringilla again if we ever get back to the lodge, which I'm sure we will. It seemed way too important to be just a one time thing. So moving on to the next part. So the final background part that we're provided with. And it is through a prisoner in Redania's Drakenborg internment camp. This guy is called Nazarian, and he discloses certain events so that he can save himself from execution. So he was one of the three men sent by Ryans to kill Codringer and Fen. So this was back in the time of contempt. I think it was around the same chapter, or maybe it was even within the same chapter, where the whole coup on Thaned took place. And these three men went in there, they killed Codringer and Fen. One of them actually got killed by Fen, so this was obviously not the guy that got killed. And it wasn't the half-elf. So the half-elf, we find out now, his name was Shiru, pronunciations, I don't know. But this was the other guy that didn't seem as nasty as the half-elf. The half-elf was the one that I think burned Fen alive. Don't, I don't even wanna go back there. But, uh, he gives this testimony when he actually, they're about to hang him and he says, nope, I've got information, please don't hang me, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll talk. So he gives this testimony and he says that after they killed Codringer and Fen, they delivered documents that they found in that building, in their home, headquarters, whatever, to Ryan's. And then the three of them, Ryan's, Shiru, and this guy Nazarian, all went to this house in Brugge and they took this girl from there and then they brought her to this fortress in Verdun and handed her over to a Nilf guardian saying she was Cyrilla of Sintra. So this was all put into a report and then this report was sent to Dijkstra and also to Philippa. So keep in mind the first two backgrounds, the thing with uh, What's her name? Asire and uh, Fringilla. And then the thing with um, Foil Tiarna. And then now with Nazarian. It's becoming common knowledge that the Siri who Amir has is fake. Which, for the Northerners, that's a good thing. Like, the misinformation could really be used to their advantage. Without any proof, I don't know how much they could possibly do with it, but it's it's definitely a good thing for them because you know that this is going to get spread everywhere. Like the the ordinary citizens are going to be finding out about this soon. It's going to be talked about. It has to be. That's always how these kind of it's always how these kind of things go. I'm just really curious to see how Amir handles it, and I really hope we get to see his perspective on what he decides to do like politically or publicly when it comes back to him that everybody knows that this theory you have is fake. I am assuming that he's going to dismiss any accusations as false rumors meant to invalidate his claim to Sintra and the other lands that would be brought under Nilfgaard once he marries 
Siri. But I think at the same time, even no matter how he handles it, I think he'll probably be okay because if nobody has any proof and if it's just a rumor, then what can they really, I mean, what, what is anybody actually going to do unless the people who are working for him believe it and then don't want to work for him anymore? But I think they're all way too afraid of him for that to happen. Like, I don't think that he's got to worry about his empire crumbling based on a rumor. So... Um, I'm really interested to see what he does to combat these claims. And I'm also really inter- interested to see what, you know, the likes of Dijkstra and Philippa are going to do about it. But I think that when it comes to Dijkstra and other Northerners, they're probably going to keep looking for the real Siri. They probably stopped. They were looking for her hard. I, they probably don't know where Geralt is I would assume they don't know where Yennefer is, considering we haven't even heard about her. That's kind of my thing at this point. It's like, if we don't know where a certain character is, I'm willing to bet that either nobody does or at the most one or two people do. So I think that that was the biggest thing that they were doing back when they were looking for Ciri. Like when everybody was trying to get her hands on her, the Northerners and Nilfgaardians, I think that they were mainly tracking Geralt and Yennefer because they were easy to track being famous people. I think that they were looking for them and then that would lead them to Siri. But now that nobody really knows where they're located, it would be difficult. But still, I think that they're going to go back searching for Siri. People might be asking about Geralt again, and then he might have to, you know, start taking down the people that are going to be tracking and hunting him. Uh, I don't know. I'm just, this is my guess. But I can see it going this way because if they can actually find the real Siri and prove that the one Amir has is fake, it's like that would be fantastic for them. That would work out really well. And then by them, I mean the, <laughs> the Northern leaders. All right. Well, I'm going to move on and talk about Regis because we got some really important information on him in this chapter. And I honestly kind of like him even more now <laughs> knowing he's a vampire because I think that the fact that, yeah, I know we don't know too much about vampires in this world. Like, we met uh, Bruxa back in the second short story of The Last Wish, and she seemed pretty terrifying. But knowing how nice Regis is and how great he's been to this group of people that he just met, and he also enjoys drinking human blood, like, that, that, that makes him a little bit more admirable, in my opinion, but... Not everybody agrees with me, <laughs> well, and we'll see who that is in a second here. But uh, so yeah, now we know how he was able to pull the horseshoe from the fire. How he was able to, which only happened in this chapter, sneak in and out of the Tamarian camp and put those guards to sleep. But we didn't know when those things were happening. How he was able to do that. But yeah, we know that it's because he's a vampire, and we learn that he is four hundred and twenty years old. So he is not a young man. And he says that he's a descendant of the survivors who were trapped in this world after the conjunction of spheres. So like most monsters, I believe, um, he did not, or his kind did not originate in this world. So Geralt, he's the one that wouldn't agree with me. He has beef with Regis. So when Regis rescues Geralt and Dandelion, Geralt figures it out in that moment what Regis is, although it's not revealed to the the reader at that point in the chapter. It doesn't come until a little bit later. And he tells him, it's best we don't meet again. And Regis, in that moment, agrees. So after Regis returns to tend to Dandelion's arrow wound, Geralt threatens him with his sword. And everybody is astounded when he does this, considering how nice... Like I keep saying, and this is not just in this episode, I've said it before, Regis is so nice. Uh, but yeah, considering how nice he is and how incredibly helpful he's been, like he's been so helpful. <laughs> and he barely even knows them. I fucking love Regis. <laughs> um, yeah, so everybody's like, what in the world are you doing, Carol? Uh, but he explains that he's a vampire and he tells him to leave. Regis does so. And um, I think that Geralt, I mean, he's a witcher. Yeah, I get that. He's a professional monster, hunter, killer. But aside from that, 
it seems like he wants him gone and he wants him to leave them alone because he's most likely had murdered people before. Like, if he's a vampire, and especially a 428-year-old vampire, it's extremely unlikely that he has gotten this far in life without murdering at least a few people. And I think that's where Geralt's main issue is. But at the same time, it's it's pretty annoying that <laughs> he's being so rude to him and he's telling him, like, to leave them alone when he wants to stick around and help and be nice and just be, uh, just like, just a, he's a pleasure to have around. He's, he's just a great guy. And, uh, I just, I don't know. I, I think I would expect that most of the readers would also agree with me that Geralt was being unreasonable. Um, I don't know. I just think that him being a witcher is not enough because Geralt doesn't want to kill every monster just because they're a monster. Like, for example, a couple chapters back, they ran into that, uh, mm, forget what it was called. It was a creepy little monster that they found in the woods, and one of the kids that that was part of like the women and children that they were escorting with Zoltan uh, ran into it at first, and she screamed, and um, Geralt scared the monster away by banging a ladle on a pot instead of killing it. And the monster was extremely venomous, he said, and there's no cure for their venom. So this monster was definitely a threat, and he didn't want to kill it. But Regis, who wasn't really, I mean, I guess he could be a threat. He didn't want him anywhere near them. I don't know. It was just pretty strange. And then you also have to consider that if Regis wanted to kill them, if he wanted to drink their blood, wouldn't he have done that by now? Like, he doesn't need to be sitting around waiting for the perfect moment to do that. He could obviously do it whenever he wants. He can travel completely unnoticed and put people people to sleep and take burning horseshoes out of fires like yeah if he wanted to do anything he could have done it by now so I think that that should have been proof enough for Geralt but it's all okay because Geralt seems to be okay with Regis and then also even Kahir um, because Regis comes back and they talk and then Geralt also talks to Kahir and then he's still acting a little bitter but they all make their soup together and Geralt eats with them and he's just kind of in a cranky mood understandably so I guess but uh, they all agree at the end that they're going to continue on together so yeah it's a it's good. I'm glad that it's happening that way because I want, I, I, I definitely want Regis around and I really want Kahir around too because he's also very nice and he seems like he could be a big help and I want to know more about him because unlike Regis, we've barely gotten to know Kahir. Like, the, like I was saying at the beginning of the episode, we have known or we have learned nothing about him up until this chapter except for the fact that he says he's not an elf guardian. He's from Vigovaro. Alrighty, well, I'm going to move into my closing thoughts here. So speaking of Kahir, uh, he's going to be moving on uh, on the journey with the group. And I think that Geralt kind of came around to it when he found out that Kahir was having the same prophetic dreams about Ciri. And he still hasn't really explained why he wants to help rescue her, though. It's just, oh, yeah, I'm having these prophetic dreams that you're having. And that's the most that we get out of him to understand why he's been trailing behind the group for so long, why he wants to go help find Siri. I still don't get it. I would like to understand that more. So maybe he'll explain that a little bit more in upcoming chapters. And unfortunately, something that wasn't good about this chapter, um, because we did get some good things that came out of it, and we also got to learn a little bit, which I always love. But one of the not so good things was that we didn't get to find out what happened to Dalton and Percival. So I don't know if we'll ever get to find out their fate. If they were killed, then there's a good chance we're not really going to... It's not going to be like a declared thing because there's not going to be any way for us to know that. And it was said that the Nilf guardians who attacked the camp were ruthlessly cutting down fugitives, showing no mercy to women or children. So they were tough guys, but I don't know if they're going to have made it out of that. It wouldn't really be shocking if they didn't. So uh, I hope that they did. I really liked those guys. Even if we don't get to see them again, I don't, you, know, you wouldn't want anything bad to happen to them. Um, also, these druids. Uh, it would be really great if they're able to help the group find out where Ciri is. And something that I was thinking about with these druids 
I wonder if it really is going to be that easy, considering anyone could go to them for help locating a person, if it were. Uh, but I don't know. I, I, we don't know anything about it. Regis just kind of casually said, oh, we can go to these druids. This is where they're located. And we'll ask them for help. But I, I'm just wondering what happens when you get there. <laughs> because if it were that easy, like, couldn't Amir just send somebody to the druids and find out where Siri is located, where the real Siri is located. I don't know. Maybe it's not a well-known thing, or maybe they owe Regis something, or there's some weird bond between vampires and druids. I'm not sure, but that's something that we're going to have to wait and find out about. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about was Siri. She is changing and not really for the better. So I know that I talked about this last episode, how our perspective on her has been super limited in Baptism of Fire so far. And I would like to be able to see more because it seems like she's getting really close with the rats. And there are some things that are going on that we didn't really see a lead up to. It's just like, boom, this is what what it is. And in the brief bit, we get to see what she's doing in this chapter. She just killed a man and he was rude, of course, but she did it without a second thought. And then she was just completely unfazed immediately after. She actually, okay, so maybe she wasn't unfazed. She was a little bit disappointed that she dropped her candy when she killed him. So that's extremely frightening. I'm just hoping that Geralt and the group can get to her fast because the rats are having a severe influence on her. Like she's going down a dark path and I can only imagine that it's going to get worse or it's going to be more difficult for her to come out of and go back to being the sweet, funny kid that we grew to love. So that was, uh, it was unpleasant. (laughs) I didn't like hearing about it. You know that when Geralt dreamt that he didn't like seeing it, I felt really bad for him when uh, Kahir was, well, I guess Kahir wasn't necessarily telling the story. He he told Geralt the, the thing, but we read it. It's like a separate, but yeah, I think Geralt must have probably felt sick to his stomach knowing that she is doing this sort of thing. And I think that Geralt's even more convinced now that these prophetic dreams he have are in fact prophetic. And it's not, uh, it's not just a coincidence. It's not him just dreaming up whatever that's not really happening. I think he probably believes it now considering Kahir is also having the same exact dreams. No way that's a coincidence. So he's been having a hard time, Geralt, like trying to get to Siri. It's been a nightmare. There have been so many obstacles and knowing what he knows and being as helpless as he's been this whole time, he's got to be feeling pretty bad. But I hope that these druids and are going to these druids makes him feel a little bit better, a little bit more hopeful, especially if somebody like Regis has confidence in it because Regis is very old, very wise, knows a lot, has probably been around the world and back a few times. So yeah, if Regis is saying it, then it's most likely something that will work out. But we're going to have to wait and see. I know I say that so much in every, in every episode. It's just, yeah, so many things that we don't get answered, but that's part of the fun. So it's all good. All right, well, that's all I have for you. So just to let you know, in case you didn't, these episodes are available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for joining, and I will catch you all in the next episode.